Here we are, it's the Physics 203 video lecture. Physics 203 video lecture seven. A lot of great stuff coming up today. So let's do a brief review and then we're gonna launch into a new chapter. I think I was able to segue into it pretty well. So what we ended with was the quadrature and in particular it was the small oscillations example it was the harmonic oscillator example so that's what we're going to pick up with this time um, just to recapitulate we've been through a lot of material and the last topic was what can you know on general principles of Lagrangian mechanics without actually solving the equation most we had the conservation laws and we talked about cyclic coordinates, conservation laws, and then the scaling behavior as well, which itself kind of led into this, into the uh, small oscillations topic. We ended with the quadrature, and so I'll just start with that. We had this right here u of x equals e. You know, that was conservation of energy for one degree of freedom. And then we solved for dx dt plus or minus 2 over m e minus u of x square root. And then to integrate that to find x of t, you first have to find t of x. So t is equal to the integral, but I'm just solving for dt and integrating. So then I have over here dx over 2 over m e minus u of x square root plus minus. And you know, we can make that an integration variable like that. And then if you can invert that you have x of t. So if you're lucky, you can get x of t. Right now you have t of x. Good. Now the example I ended with was if u of x is equal to 1 half kx squared, then we can plug that in there do the integration, get the inverse cosine or the inverse sine, you know, pick, your, pick your sign there. And getting the inverse cosine here, then you invert that, you get cosine omega t. Yeah. So that's what we ended with then going through these steps. And I think I recommended those as a homework problem, certainly worth doing. Then you finally end up with x of t is equal to a cos omega t plus b, omega is root k over m. So yes, and this points out the interesting fact that small oscillations, linear harmonic oscillators, one of the few theories we can do from beginning to end for which we have a closed solution, closed form solution. Good, so what we're going to do next is the theory of small oscillations with many degrees of freedom. I'm gonna start with one degree of freedom. So I'm gonna go over the process that gets us here, and then we'll do it for many degrees of freedom. So small oscillations for systems with many degrees of freedom. And it turns out this is something we need the Lagrangian formalism for. Right here, this was what we had learned before, Newtonian mechanics. But the Lagrangian formalism will allow us to do many degrees of freedom. Systems with many degrees of freedom. Good. And we have some Lagrangians already that we're going to be able to take 
and analyze further. Some Lagrangians we've worked on previously will be used in this uh, in this chapter. So first, though, we're going to talk about one degree of freedom. So I'll just say n equals one. And since we're talking about systems with many degrees of freedom, let's go ahead and actually let's do this. This is our general Lagrangian that we're learning to work with. We have n degrees of freedom. Ij go from 1 to n. Qi dot, oh, yeah, Qi dot, Qj dot, minus u of q. Okay. That's our general Lagrangian. Now we're going to do one degree of freedom, n equals one. L is now a half a of q, q dot squared minus u of q. And this looks like it's a little bit more general than one half n v squared, okay? Because the coefficient has a function of the coordinate, even though we're just with one degree of freedom. So I'm going to give an example of this right away, which is a nice one. And the example system is when we have in the xy plane. is y equals f of x curve, and we're going to have a frictionless bead that can move along the curve. Okay? So no friction, and but I've clearly drawn a local minimum at x sub 0. And in keeping with this, I could call this q. Okay? I could call x q, but I'll just stay with this right now. Okay? So what's the Lagrangian for this system? So Let's just call it frictionless bead. Right. We've actually done something like this because we had an object that was hanging off of a, with a pendulum hanging from it. So let's just look at this individual system. It's easier. We've got the frictionless bead mass m going along that curve there. So here's what we have to do. First, start with our definition of kinetic energy and Cartesian coordinates, y is f of x, so y dot is f prime of x, x dot, right? That's your chain rule, once again. Okay. So when you go in there, you now end up with t is equal to 1 half m x dot squared plus f prime of x squared x dot squared. So that's why we have a 1 plus f prime of x squared x dot squared. u of x is just mg f of x because, of course, we're assuming gravity in the down direction, okay, negative y direction. So now we can put together our Lagrangian. One degree of freedom, L equals one half M one plus F prime of X squared. There we go. F prime of X squared, X dot squared minus MG F of X. Okay, so here's a really good Lagrangian. This is something you can work on. Okay. There's the Lagrangian, and I'm going to point out what is our A of Q. Okay. So this is the Lagrangian of this form here. The A of Q is apparently everything in this red bracket. Okay? And this is clearly a function of the coordinate. So yeah, there's an example of such a Lagrangian.
So how do we go from that Lagrangian and this, with the star to the small oscillations? Yeah, this construct is perfect. You can see we're going to be around this local minimum. We're going to expand the potential energy and we're going to evaluate the kinetic energy at the local minimum. So I'm doing this for one degree of freedom and I'm going to repeat it for n degrees of freedom. And there's some great applications and examples along the way. I think I'll even bring in a couple demonstrations that we have backstage here. If not today, then next time. Yeah. So here's what we do. Um, first of all, we need a local minimum of the potential energy. Local minimum of potential energy, and of course we have one here. Then u, oh, of potential energy at q sub zero. U of q, u of q is equal to u q sub zero plus u prime. So I'm expanding in the Taylor series up to second order. higher terms. So what we'd require is that this thing exist and be positive. Of course, since we're at a local minimum, this vanishes, and this is a constant. Okay. So because of that, we can replace u of q by one half k x squared, where k is the second derivative evaluated at q sub 0, and x is the small quantity q minus q sub 0. So that's how we deal with the potential energy that we've done in the past. Now what about the kinetic energy? Here what we do is we evaluate the kinetic energy at q sub zero. And the justification for that is as follows. Suppose you expand a of q and you have a of q zero plus the derivative times q minus q zero plus higher terms. This time, we don't need the quadratic term. We're going to keep q minus q0 sufficiently small so that this entire thing is negligibly small compared to a of q0. And we can always do that. That's the meaning of this small oscillations expression. You can make them arbitrarily small. So make small, and when I want this small, it's compared to a of q0, so this is what I retain. So now, what do we have? Uh, so this is our u of q, and then we have kinetic energy is at half m x dot squared. Okay, I've chosen m and k for, for sentimental reasons, you could put it that way. So this m is defined as a of q0. And of course, the x dot is equal to q dot because q0 is a constant. So that's how I go from this Lagrangian to what I'm about to write down. And uh, don't be 
irritated by my M's and X's here. Right, so this was my A of U in my nomenclature over there. And this, of course, was my U of Q. So what we're left with is Yeah, let me go ahead and just use this so I have all these things in front of us still. So now the small, what I call L sub S O, the small oscillations Lagrangian. small oscillations that run here. L small oscillations with those definitions up there looks like this. And you immediately recognize this is your simple harmonic motion Lagrangian. Take the Euler Lagrange equations and you're just going to find the um, equation of the simple harmonic oscillator. Euler Lagrange equations lead to this right here. Okay. By the way, if you don't just see that, leave some space in your notes and do the Euler, um, write out the Euler Lagrange equation for this singular, not plural, for this object here. Of course, you immediately come up with this. And then what's been erased now, but what I had on the board before, x of t is a cos omega t plus b. So yeah, that's that's the short version of the whole theory of small oscillations. We're assuming that once you get here, you know the answer. Okay. What we're going to do next is this very same process, but on the full Lagrangian, okay. and that'll. That's actually formally a really nice development because I'm going to make it, I'm going to choose my coefficients to make it look like this equation except it's going to be a matrix equation. This is just one degree of freedom. We're going to turn this into a matrix equation which has a solution where, this, where the linear differential equation systems with constant coefficients just deliver our solution up to us. Okay, so it's a really nice topic. But I, I decided to review the one degree of freedom version just so you remember how this all goes. Okay. You've got a local minimum. You're expanding to quadratic order, which means basically you're fitting a parabola into that local minimum there. And that's why it takes the form that it does. OK, good. Let's. Tackle the big problem. This example system is so nice. I'll probably put this or something similar on the exam. Okay. Okay, so now the n degree of freedom version of this. Now sometimes I do a whole lecture on the multivariable Taylor expansion. But I'm going to assume we know it and I'll just I'll explain as I go along there. We need the multivariable Taylor expansion. Um, so here's a good time to refresh our memory. We're starting with the Lagrangian up there again. So I'll just rewrite this. I j, k i j of q, q i dot q j dot. So this time, one to n, okay, n variables, q one to q n. And our system has a local minimum 
or the potential energy has a local minimum at Q sub zero. So the potential energy has a local minimum at Q sub zero, and we call that a stable equilibrium. So it has a stable equilibrium. The systems we talked about the other day, I'll even put this example here. You know, we've got our mass, capital M, we've got the pendulum, lowercase m, hanging from it. We've got the angle theta. The stable equilibrium is when m is e when x is equal to zero, or, or when this spring is in its relaxed state, and when this angle is zero. That's your stable equilibrium. And then if theta increases, potential energy increases, and if x increases or decreases, potential energy increases as well. So it's a stable equilibrium and it's a minimum of the uh, potential energy. And here Q sub zero equals, I'll just say X equals zero, theta equals zero. Okay, those, are, those are our two coordinates. Okay, so we expand. U of X in a Taylor series. And the Taylor series looks like this. Actually, somebody can tell me during office hours if you want to review the Taylor series more thoroughly, but I'll show you what we have here for now. Taylor series, U of Q, I'll use the vector for all N of these variables, U of Q sub zero, that's a constant term, plus the linear term. So the linear term, I equals one to N, partial U partial Q sub I, evaluated at Q sub zero. So that's just a constant, times Q minus Q sub zero. So instead of one, you have a whole sum of these. And then your quadratic term, where we're going to end, i and j, d squared u, dqi, dqj of q0, makes way. Then we have qi minus q0, Qj minus Q0. So Qi minus Q0i, Qj minus Q0j. There we go. And then you would have higher terms, but we stop right here. This is a positive definite quadratic form. These here all vanish at an equilibrium point. So you same first derivative criterion as before. So at a stable equilibrium, these all vanish. And this, of course, is a constant. So just as before, we can rewrite our potential energy. with these definitions. It's really going to be just like this, but let's take it step by step. zero, 
So we have one half double sum ij. I'm going to put kij here, xi, xj. So that's a much nicer quadratic form. So what do we have here? This kij is the second derivative. Okay, mixed partial derivatives evaluated at q sub zero. So those kij's are constants. The xi is just the qi minus qi zero as before. And xi dot is going to be qi dot. So there's our potential energy. Now the same thing is going to happen with these coefficients here that happened with the single one. Okay, so I'm not even going to write it out. But rather I'll go straight to T is equal to one half double sum IJ M I J X I dot xj dot and this mij is equal to aij of q0 under the assumption that if you expand these functions close enough to equilibrium you're just taking the yeah q0 you're just taking that constant so these are all constants. Anything else? Yeah, and now I'll write out the small oscillations to draw in. This is something we want to be able to construct. Because the double sum n i j x j dot minus K I J X I X J. Other authors will use different letters here. Landau and Lishes used M and K. I think that's kind of nice um, because it looks so much like the one-dimensional case. But remember, these are coefficients that are obtained from that system. They're not masses. They're not spring constants per se. All right, we're just using that form. So some important notes here. Let's put a box around this guy. Is that Mij and equals Mji. This can always be done. So the symmetry Kji. Symmetry is always possible. It's actually something you build into your matrix when you're constructing your Lagrangian. Okay, so, so I'm going to write here symmetric, parentheses, always possible. Um, so symmetric, positive, definite quadratic forms. So that's some terminology you want to be aware of. So the whole the, the analysis in linear algebra of quadratic form plays a role in what follows, and positive definite quadratic forms. That just means that they're always positive, um, that this entire sum is always positive, because it came out of 1 half mv squared. So it came out of the kinetic energy and this is always going to be positive or zero because it came out of a local minimum. Okay. But the Mij and Kij, you can think of them as square n by n matrices. They're symmetric and they're positive definite. Okay. Good. And like I said, this Taylor expansion, I can actually derive this for you guys, but as it is, it, once you get used to it, it's really understandable bookkeeping basically because you can just go through you know i and j go from one to n so you've got a one 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 two one three etc terms there 
good. Let's send that up. I keep going, maybe I'll do an example here. We have a couple of examples in the prior lectures that where we can operate on them and get this thing right here. So first this always possible business. The reason these can always be made possible, I think can always be made symmetric is that you have, let's write this out, for n equals 2. Okay, let's write it out explicitly. We have 1 half m11 x1 dot squared m12 x1 dot x2 dot plus 1 half m21 x2 dot x1 dot. See, if you only had this one and you were missing M21, you could just uh, take half of it and place one half here and one half there. Because they're multiplying the x1 dot, x2 dot in both cases. You have plus one half M22 x2 dot squared. And you do the same thing just reading them off here with a K1, et cetera, X1, X2. So that's how that works for a two by two. So you can just you know, read them off and write them down like a machine, no problem. Let me put as the homework, that system that I just erased. So we had the Lagrangian sure we did, capital M, M, L, yeah, theta, and X, okay. So we had this system, and we want to go from the Lagrangian to the small oscillation to Lagrangian. L, from Lagrangian, from L, construct, L small oscillations. As we go through with this, by the way, we're going to see that we don't even have to always construct the small oscillation of the branch. I want you to see how it goes, though. Eventually, we're just going to pick off all of these quantities. Okay? We're going to pick these off and write them down and construct our matrices. So we don't actually need this so much as we need those two matrices, but everything in due time. We can construct the small oscillations, uh, Lagrangian, and here I'll even write and complete the analysis. Because at the end of this hour, we should have the whole analysis in place. And if not this hour, then the next. So complete the analysis frequencies. Etc. Okay. So yeah, there's an example, and your variables are theta and, and x in this case. Okay, I'm going to erase this because so I want to keep working with what we have above there. Uh, well, one more thing. So next, we're going to take the Euler-Lagrange equation for this Lagrangian. Next, equations. And I'll just write down what we're going to do. We need for the kth particle, right? We're summing i and j, so we have to take the kth particle, p over dt, partial L small oscillation, partial x k dot, minus partial L small oscillation, partial x k is equal to zero, for k equals one to n. Okay, so we're going to get a system of coupled differential equations 
out of this Lagrangian right here. So this is what I have to do. I'll keep my eye on that one and erase this board. See how we're doing time-wise. Okay, good. We've got nothing but time. So we have to write out the Euler Lagrange equations for this Lagrangian here. And what makes it doable and easy is the fact that we replace those coefficients that were functions with constants. That makes all the difference. So let's have at it. This is the equation we're going to write out. And in fact, we're going to see we just have to understand it and do it for one of the two. We'll do the, the potential energy. And this is going to have almost exactly the same form. So this is the one that I'm going to write out. Okay. Okay, here we go. Negative DL small oscillation D X of K. And I'm looking at this object right here. Took the minus of it, so I'm going to do negatives in here. So we're at that, we're ending up with one half. We're going to go through the double sum, I and J, and we can go right through the constants because they're constants, and now we have D D X K of X I X J. So there's a product rule. And with the kth index here, so one half i j k i j. Now we're going to have, if we hold x i constant and differentiate x j with respect to x k, we're going to get the Kronecker delta j k. And if we hold xj constant, we're going to have the same thing with the Kronecker delta ik. And remember, delta ik is equal to 1, i equals k, 0, i not equal to k. Kronecker delta. So this is good. This collapses this sum here. So only when j is equal to k do we have a non-zero contribution here. So we have 1 half sum over i. So we've summed over j. j is equal to k. So we have k of i k x i. And for the second sum, Only when i is equal to k do we have a non-zero contribution from the i sum. So we're summing over j, k sub, OK, so the kj xj. Now, here's where the symmetry comes into play, because kik is equal to k ki. And then i is the summation variable, j is over here. These two sums are exactly the same. So if you add them up, you get rid of the 1 half. And you know, get rid of this. You get rid of the 1 half, and you end up with sum over k sub k j x. J. A little awkward with the subscript, but that's the way it goes. J equal 1 to n. Okay, I did this one here, but now you'll notice that ignoring the complete time derivative for a moment, 
The same thing is going to happen when I differentiate with respect to xk dot, because that's the only difference here, the dot xij, xi dot xj dot. So I'm going to have the same form, and when I'm done with that, the same form, I'll take a time derivative. And so the second one I can just write down for free. B, B, T, B, L, B, X, K, dot, is going to be equal to, first of all, I'll write the sum, J equals 1 to N, M, K, J, X, J, dot. That would have been the exact analog of this thing here. But when I take the time derivative, since these are constants, I just have two dots. Okay, so now we're really somewhere. Okay, we have this, and we have this. I'm just gonna add them together. I'm gonna have to erase what's on the board now. So we just took the Euler Lagrange equations of this small oscillation is Lagrangian. And we're now going to write this down. And I'm going to change my subscripts from K, I'll rename them. But it's going to be the same thing. OK, so let's erase. By the way, this is a great calculation to learn how to do. And you should practice it. But you're not actually going to have to do it in special cases anymore because as soon as I write these equations down, I'm going to solve them. So you'll see this technique with the differentiation. We've already seen that before. So now we have the Euler-Lagrange equations of our system. And we can write them like this, sum of m, i, j, x, j, second derivative plus k, i, j, x, j, j equals 1 to n equals 0. So think of these m's as matrices. You can see this is a matrix multiplication. Matrix times a vector. Um, so I'm going to put down two things. So that, Oh, and since I'm summing j equals 1 to n, so here it's done. i is equal to 1 to n. So there are n of these equations in here of this form. So the first thing we're going to note, suppose n is equal to 1, then mx second derivative plus kx equals 0. Linear harmonic oscillator. Okay, so that's nice. That's nice that the form is the same here. Um, second note, is we want to interpret this as a matrix equation because you're going to see it's much simpler that way. This is a matrix equation. Let M designate this M I J matrix and K designate this K I J. I'm giving it an uppercase, but you would have to do that. And x is this x1 to xn vector. So x is all the xi. This is, these are the two square matrices. And what we're looking at is m x second derivative plus k x equals zero. We're looking at a matrix times a vector. So you've got something like this. M11, M1N, 
M N one to M N N times X one to X N. Second derivative, okay, I'm gonna put two dots on top of this. Actually, let's put the dots inside. A lot of dots there, okay? Be careful. And then you would have plus K11 to K1N, KN1 to KNN, X1 to XN equals zero. That's what these equations written out would look like in square matrix column vector form. And Of course, this is a nice way, a nice compact way to look at that because this is our one degree of freedom and this is our n degrees of freedom. So you're going to have to remember some linear algebra that you learned at some point. So the process takes us this far. All of these coefficients have been defined in terms of the derivative terms of the kinetic energy values and the expansion coefficients of the potential energy. And the x's are the small displacements from equilibrium. So good. What we're going to do next is solve this thing also once and for all with linear algebra. Okay, so solve that equation. We'll have a little more room here. So to solve, uh, to solve this system of linear differential equations, so there's terminology. It's a system of linear differential equations with constant coefficients. That's the kind of thing you can look up if you need to know more. Constant coefficients. So to solve this system, you make use of the trial solution, which is the general solution to a situation like this. Uh, what we do is we let x sub j, x sub i, j, whatever, x sub j equal a sub j e to the i omega t. This is your general trial solution, an exponential. Because it was a conservative system, okay, because energy was conserved, these omegas are going to be real. If they were not real, you'd either have damping or anti-damping, and both would violate conservation of energy, because you'd have exponential damping. So omega is real, and we take this into our differential equation. Um, first, we know that the two derivatives are gonna bring I omega down omega squared aj e to the i omega t. So we can take this into our equation there. I'm going to write out the sum. Sum j equals 1 to n. m i j Omega squared AJ minus omega T plus KIJ AJ e to the 
Let's clean that up. E to the i omega t can be factored out, and it's never zero, so we can eliminate that. What we're going to have is sum j equal 1 to n minus omega squared m i j plus k i j a j equals zero. Well, this is really important. Because this is recognizably that matrix multiplication again. You know, if you're summing from over J, K, I, J, A, J, that's row times column of a matrix times vector multiplication. Matrix, row, times column, vector. Same thing here, M, I, J, A, J. So this equation, I think it's labeled star, see that that star has the form minus omega squared m plus k times the vector a is equal to zero. Okay, again, so matrix multiplication looks very much like your standard eigenvalue, eigenvector equation, except what you're used to having is a diagonal matrix here, and in small oscillations, we generally don't have a diagonal matrix. Otherwise, it's the same thing. And in linear algebra, we learned that this equation only has a non-trivial solution, that is to say, a solution where A is not the zero vector, when the the determinant of this thing in here has to be um, when the determinant vanishes. Because the vanishing determinant of a matrix tells us that it has linearly dependent rows and columns. Okay. So, so I'll write that in words. Non-trivial uh, non solution. So I will call this double star. only has a non-trivial solution when, if and when, the determinant of the matrix minus omega squared m plus k is equal to zero. So this thing expanded out gives us what's called the characteristic polynomial. And it will be n order, and there will be n solutions in general to this omega squared quantity. Um, and the reality that I say these things are real somewhere, I said it. Yeah, yeah, these are real, and therefore omega squared is real as well. Omega sub i squared are the roots of the characteristic polynomial. Characteristic polynomial. And if you find them, you're done. You've solved the problem. Polynomial. Okay. Characteristic polynomial. So the goal is to find these, and then their square root, they're real. You go back to your trial solution here, where it was right here, and then you found your solution. Because then you have x, j, and uh, the entire column vector now, 1 to n, with its whole, with its whole set of frequencies that comprises the solution. So we're going to have to go through a concrete case of this um, because we, we pretty much have the, at least the outlines of the full theory right here, all the way down to its solution. So these are our solutions. Let me go ahead and put that right here. Got a box. So, 
x sub j is now e a sub j. Well, I have it right there. So. The set of omega sub j are called the characteristic frequencies, also known as the eigenfrequencies, okay? Characteristic frequencies. And these frequencies, so that's the goal of the theory of small oscillations, is to find the characteristic frequencies of course, since this is an eigenvector eigenvalue problem, I'm going to put that down in a moment, then you could also ask, once you found the frequencies, you could ask, what are these vectors A? Those would be the eigenvectors. So yeah, let's put this as a little more grand result. We're about to call it good. So we have set of omega sub j are the eigenfrequencies and the vectors A are the corresponding, in fact, I could give the vector a subscript too, but I'm not going to. Okay. There's a whole set of these um, are the eigenvectors. And if you get these eigenfrequencies and the eigenvectors, you can construct the behavior, very interesting behavior of these uh, systems. I'm going to finish with the system that we're going to talk about next time. We'll set this up. So I'm going to. And I'll bring in a demonstration of that system as well. So. of this in the form of some coupled pendula. Okay, so we have mass, mass in the lower case. We have two identical masses, no friction in the system, and we have three springs. These are K. And this one has a spring constant k prime. So the motion is in x. And when everything is relaxed, we have x1 equals 0, x2 equals 0. Springs are relaxed. So that's your equilibrium. Times x equals 0. And there are a bunch of phenomena, some interesting phenomena associated with this system. So we're going to take this one all the way through to completion. We'll get everything we, we can possibly know about this. And I'll do that, and you guys will do some of your systems that you already have the Lagrangians for. So good. This is a good place to stop. There's a lot here. As I, I as advertised and I showed you, we did the Euler-Lagrange equations and we actually solved them. These are our results here in the boxes. So you don't actually have to do the Euler-Lagrange equations of your system. You have to collect all of these coefficients and things, you know, write them down, understand what they are. But this calculation is really good practice for you guys. So especially under the current situation, um, doing these like Repeating this entire proof and really understanding it is as good as anything that you could be doing. So if you have time for that and questions on that, I'd be glad to answer them as well. Good. So next time we're going to launch into this system right here. And until then, have fun.
See you later.